All right, welcome to Faith and Victory Church. Tonight we're teaching on um, <clears throat> part two of how you can be led by the Spirit of God. Our series text is found in uh, Proverbs 20, 27, where it says, The Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Now my Marge just says the lamp, some translations say the light. So the inward man, or the spirit man, the spirit man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. And last week, we talked about how you can be led by the Spirit of God. We talked about a bunch of things. I, it's just too much to go back and try to recover all that because it was so much there um, in that particular sermon that to me to recover it would, would take us too long. So go listen to it. We have a Roku. We have a YouTube. We have streaming. We have uh, downloads. There's all kinds of ways you can get our sermons, all right? Videocast, podcast, Roku boxes, YouTube they're all out there for your benefit. doesn't cost you a thing. Somebody called the church recently and said, how can I buy your sermons? I said, we don't sell them. You can get them for free. Yeah. Hallelujah. Online. Yeah, but I want to get a hard copy. Download it and burn it. And I said, but if you really want one, contact us. We'll, get, we'll try to figure out how to get your hard copy. Um, but, you know, it really just better get your little MP3 stick, little, little thumb drive and stick it in there and down, download it and go wherever you want to. All right. So. But last, last week was part one. This is part two. We're going to talk about tonight um, how to be led by the Spirit of God. We're going to talk about the, uh, the inward witness, and we're going to talk about the inward voice. All right. Let's go, if you will, with, to Romans 8, 16. Uh, this is I'm really wanting to get up and preach. Now, tomorrow night, we'll be praying for us. We'll, um, we'll be going down to Pastor Bill Carver's over in Fayetteville and preaching his faith conference tomorrow night. Right. Hallelujah. And then in May, first week of May, I'm preaching down at... Uh, uh, Helen Locust Church. Brother Larry went home right before Christmas, but Sister Locust and, and I'm going down and preaching their, um, their um, pastor appreciation in their pastor appreciation week. Uh, so just be, be in prayer with us about those meetings that God will have his way and do what he wants and we'll be sensitive to the Holy Ghost and get the will of God done. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 16 says the Spirit, uh, I, and I always like to put himself, because really understanding the Greek the way the Greek language was structured, um, since the word spirit is genderless, it's neither male nor female in, in, its, in its language, then the rules of, of Greek is that the, the pronoun that follows it must be genderless. But we know from other scripture that the spirit is, is a person. So it's not an it. Okay? And the King James did translate it, the spirit itself. I just, I just change it uh, because when the comforter has come, he will lead you and guide, and guide you into all truth. Amen? When, when, when there's other different words used to describe the Spirit of God, um, it's used with gender, it's used in the, in, with a male gender, okay? The Holy Spirit's not a she, all right? The Father is the Father, not the Holy Mother, all right? People, got, people come up with all kinds of stuff, you know? The Father, the Father God is the Father God. And you got people who rewrote Bibles, the feminist Bible. You know, in the beginning, God created this, and she said that. Yeah, well, God knows what he is. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, this is the very first thing we need to understand, that the primary and number one way that God communes with us, speaks to us, directs us, talks to us, is not and I'm just going to kind of jump way ahead of my sermon here, is not with prophecy, is not with uh, writing in the sky, is not with handwriting on the wall, is not with visions or dreams. It is through the inward witness. That is the number one. Now, is a, he doesn't use other things, but the number one way. I'm going to tell you, if you're waiting to be led by visions and dreams, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Yeah. <clears throat> if you're seeking someone to give you a word, you're going to get in trouble. Now, why do you say that? Don't you believe in words? I do believe in words. But if you're seeking them, the devil will accommodate you. You'll get somebody that'll give you something that didn't come from God, came from, came from the devil because you were seeking after something instead of letting, and letting God do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. The Spirit manifests himself as he wills. Amen? I remember when I first got saved, we got caught up with this little group that was in our church, and they had what they called cottage prayer meetings. Now, it was a double-wide trailer. I don't know why they were calling it a cottage. <laughs> I just don't know why. I mean, that's what they did. They called it the cottage prayer meeting. Somehow, though, they had, that carried greater 
authority, that it was a cottage prayer meeting. Well, all it was was a cottage prophesied over everybody meeting. Everybody get together, lay hands on everybody, and everybody had a word for everybody, and when you got done, everybody had a word from everybody. <laughs> and about 99.9% .9 of the words were all the same. I mean, you know, you could have just recorded one and give it, just say, okay, your turn, here's yours, your turn, click, your turn, click, and you could have done it for each person that was doing it. The, are you mocking the gifts of the Spirit? No. I believe in the manifestation of the Spirit, but it's the prophet with all. The Bible says, that even talking about prophecy and, and interpretation, so forth, two or three at the most, and that the others judge. You don't just have everybody in the room prophesy over everybody, everybody in the room. That's not, that's not the way the Bible lays it out. Yeah. And God said they that are led by the Spirit of the sons of God, not they that are led by somebody's prophecy. Prophecy, and, I, and I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna just kind of hodgepodge in here for a second. Prophecy, when somebody gives you a word, should confirm and not direct. Yeah. Biblically, it should confirm and not direct. Now, I know God can, but I'm talking about, I'm, I'm talking about in me, in general terms, and in primarily most of the time things. Has God ever done? Yes, God does other things. But the problem is there's so much misuse by people that you've got to understand what the general propensity is of God. Amen? God, you know, um, as, you know, as a matter of fact, I remember when, when, um, um, when Paul met the Lord on the Damascus Road, and he went, and then the Lord appeared unto Ananias in a vision, and said, so go pray for one Saul of Tarsus uh, in the house of Simon the Tanner. Uh, da, 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 for he, he, he prayeth. And he said, I've heard of this man, how great destruction is brought on the church, and so forth and so on. And the Lord told him, he said, go your way, do as I've told you, for I will show him. Who? I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. The Lord was going to show him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Isn't that right? So, <clears throat> understand God's primary method. And, and I, I always want to leave room for exception because I'm not going to say God can't walk into a, you know, come into a room and somebody be yielded to the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God speak to somebody and it not be God. Yes, it could be God, but you can't be looking for that and you can't be depending on that. I like I tell people this, you know, when somebody comes and lays hands on you and says, thou art called to go to Africa and go into the bush and win the lost. Okay. If you've never heard that before in your life and God had witnessed that to your spirit, you better take them with you. Why? So they can say, yay, it's time to go home. Amen. Amen. If, if, you, if, you're, if, it's, if it's not already in your spirit, quickened in your spirit, I know people who do stuff who, who do not believe, who in their own heart, I, I, I know those cases where people go and get married. Somebody's come and say, yay, yeah, you're supposed to get married. The Lord's shown me. Your, yeah. The Lord showed you. Why did he show me? I'm the one marrying her, not you. Hello? She's the one marrying him, not you. And why is the Lord showing you that we're supposed to get married and not me? I know people who get married and they don't even like the person. But if somebody prophet, and I'm, 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 let me just say this. When I say somebody prophesied over them, I'm using that term very loosely because if it was prophecy, it would be of God. All right? But they call it prophesying. Uh, you know, I call it button in. Hello, that's a button-in meeting. You button in where you don't belong. Amen? Yeah, going to prophesy over people telling them they're supposed to get married, and, 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 and they don't even like each other, or they argue and fight all the time, but they're going to get married because brother so-and-so prophesied we're supposed to get married. Don't! You don't marry somebody because somebody told you you're supposed to marry them. You better marry them because you want to marry them, and you love them. Hello? You talk about wanting to have the wrath of hell unloosed on your life for the rest of your life. Marry somebody you don't like. <laughs> Hello? Just because somebody else prophesied over you. Now, I've said this, I've said this in the past couple of weeks so, and when teaching along these lines. Today, to this date, to this date, my, I've been in the ministry 30 years. I've yet, now, well, I know somebody, well, I don't. I've never seen anyone that was prophesied to get married that won't plan on getting married before they got the prophecy that stayed married. Every case that I personally know of, they ended up in divorce. Now, sometimes it was 5, 10, 15 years later. Sometimes it was earlier than that. But I don't know of anybody that ever stayed together because of that. Eventually, eventually, 
it wore old. Because I'm going to tell you, when, you, when you're in the, the deepest, darkest pits of marital issues, the last thing you need coming up is, well, the only reason you married her is because somebody prophesied over you. You're supposed to. And you didn't do it because you wanted to and your heart was in it. And you made the commitment out of your own heart. And I was like, that's what anything you do for God. You got to do something because somebody prophesied to you and it wasn't in your heart. You're asking for more trouble than a barrel of monkeys. And that's a lot of trouble. All right. No. The inward witness. Our, now, see, the inward witness is a, is a knowing in your spirit. <clears throat> it's just, it's, just it's, a, it's an inner knowing that you're doing the right thing. Let me say this. When you have an inner witness by the, from the Holy Spirit to your spirit, it's hard to talk people out of stuff because on the inside you know it's the right thing to do. Now, in the New Testament, how many, how many believe we're under the New Testament? Mm -hmm. yeah. We're under the New Testament. We're not under the Old. All right? The believer is not led by the prophet. Actually, if you'll study New Testament prophets, they're not, they don't function and operate the same way the Old Testament prophets did. There's a difference in how they minister throughout the New Testament. As a matter of fact, you see them um, confirming reaffirming different things. Under the Old Testament, they just flat out came out, set your house in order, you're going to die. I mean, you know, remember that? Hezekiah was, you know, was sitting there, and the prophet came in and said, set your house in order for today, you should surely die. He got off the throne, repented, and before the prophet could get out the front court, the Lord said, go back and tell him, I'll give him 15 more years. And he did. And he got the 15 more years. Amen. You know, um, but in the Old Testament, only the prophet, the priest, and the king had the anointing on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The people didn't. Under the Old Covenant, the prophet, priest, and king were anointed. That is not true of the New Testament. Every believer yeah. has the anointing coming on them. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Well, who's the spirit? He is the anointing. The Holy Spirit is the anointing. Amen. You have, you know, we, and we, we got scriptures that cover that. John, uh, John 2 and uh, 20 talks about the, having the unction and, and the Holy, and then did 27, I think it is, the, 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 uh, <coughs> that the anointing. So the, the Holy Spirit is the anointing. And he is a person, but he is the anointing. He's what you're anointed with. Mm -hmm. Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Remember when Jesus came up out of the water, baptized, what, what came on him? The Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. What does Acts 10, 38 says? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. <coughs> he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the anointing. Under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit only came on the prophet, the priest, or the king. So you had to go to one of them to get direction. No one knew where else to go. You couldn't go to Job. Job was about as annoying as you were. Not. All right? You and Job together made up no anointing. You had to find a prophet, priest, or king to get something from heaven. Now, see, this is where the church at Rome is messed up today. They still had the priests as the go-betweens. And that was not the New Testament plan. That was not, in that day, I won't have, you know, God said he was going he, he to come out of that temple. He's going to come out of that veil, I made the hands of man, and he's going to move into the heart of man. Know ye not, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen? So, in the New Testament, now listen. Under the Old Testament, the prophet, the priest, and the king had the Holy Ghost on them. In the New Testament, every believer has the Holy Ghost in them. That's why the inward witness is so important and to understand that's where he leads and guides from primarily amen the guidance may come but it only comes to confirm what's already known in the heart of the, of the individual and, and and with that in mind we should not seek a prophet's confirmation you're really setting you're, you're really uh, working against God when you go after trying to get somebody to confirm what God put in your heart Amen. 
The inward, now listen, the inward witness is not a voice. It's rather a knowing in your spirit, in the inner man. This is the primary way God leads us. Now, I remember when I first got saved. Um, July 11th, 1979, at the First Pentecostal Holiness Church, the corner of Brinkley Road and Plaza Drive, about 7.45 p.m. on a Wednesday night. Hallelujah. And I, and I know the man. I can, look, I can see the man. I, he was filling in for Pastor Gentry. And uh, he was preaching. He thinks his sermon got me saved. I didn't hear a thing he said. The Holy Ghost dealt, had been dealing with me for weeks. I got to church, and I, it, took, it took everything for me to get up, keep from getting up right in the middle of the sermon and going down and getting saved. Grandma danced up and down the aisle three times. Hallelujah. You know, a week, uh, week later or so, uh, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Wasn't, actually, it wasn't any week. It was that far on Wednesday night. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Was, July 11th, 1979 was a Sunday night. Did y'all know that? No. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But almost immediately, I knew I was called to the ministry. Something on the inside began to stir with me. And I'd be, within a month's time, I knew I would try, travel to the Orient to preach. Nobody told me that. Nobody prophesied that to me. Just on the inside, I knew it. You know, it took 20 years for me to go to the Orient to preach, but I did go. It took 20 years. That's a long time. But you know what? God doesn't deal with time like we do. Amen. Hallelujah. So the primary way God leads us is in the inner man. I just knew I knew I was called to the ministry. Now, because I was in a, my denominational church, I was supposed to go down to uh, South Carolina and go to Holmes College of the Bible. Now, I'm, my pastor had gone there. A lot of good people have gone there. But that wasn't where I was supposed to go. Now, everybody's pushing me to go there. But someone, it was, someone wouldn't let me go. Just something on the inside wouldn't let me go. Was it wrong for you to go there? No, it would have been if I had gone because God didn't want me. That wasn't God's plan for my life. I know people have gone there. It was God's plan for them to go there. That's, that's what's wonderful. I'm not, I'm not against the school. That just wasn't God's plan for me. Now, you understand when you're in a denominational church, when you get saved, you say you're called to the ministry, you go to their school. That's what you do. And grandma's going to make sure that's where you go. And all the elders and the deacons, and the pastor, and the conference superintendent. They all going to get you down there. <clears throat> well, I kept, I had the application for months sitting on my dress. I would never fill it out. Everybody's saying, he's going, he's going to such, he's going down, the, you know, he's leaving, he's going, I mean, everybody had me going. Christmas of that year that I got saved, my parents said, you're not going, are you? I said, I, 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 don't, I can't explain it. I didn't, know what, I didn't know what being led by the Spirit was. See, you can be led by the Spirit and not even know you're being led by the Spirit. Right. You just know you're not supposed to do something. See, that, that's what that inward knowing is. That's what that inward witness is. You're being led by the Spirit of God without spectacular, without visions, without dreams, without prophecy. You just know this is the right thing for me to do. Now, understand this. If, you, if what you know is the right thing for you to do doesn't line up with the Bible, then it ain't the Holy, it ain't, it ain't the Holy Ghost and it's not the inward witness. All right? Um, I just, so I said, I can't explain to you. I'm just not, I just can't go. Well, everybody's going to be disappointed. Grandma's going to be really disappointed, you know. Well, what had happened, um, in the meantime, from the time I got saved to the time that I was, I was supposed to be leaving and going, uh, a guy in our church who had gone through the Pentecostal Holiness uh, home ordination process, took him two years, and he had gotten ordained, license, actually at that point, point in time he got licensed, and uh, Seth had come to me and said, look, you know, if I was going to go to Bible school, I'd go here. And he handed me this little brochure book booklet, from, and, and, on, and it was just a little red book, front, front cover on the front cover, down the bottom in small case letters that said Rhema. And I opened it up, and on the inside, the first page it was a fully black photo page with the, gold, with the full color logo of the Rhema Bible Training Center seal. If you've been in my office and looked at my wall, that's with my graduation certificate. That page is. That's where that page came from. And I looked at it, and I kind of flipped through the book and saw a guy named Kenneth Hagin. Never heard him preach. Didn't know who he was. Later, 
I, fi I found out that he, you know, he taught Copeland because Copeland would talk about him. But I didn't know who, I still didn't know who he was. And I flipped through and looked at the, oh, yeah, that's cool. Then I looked at the price. My God, I can't go there. I don't know anything about faith. I don't know anything about believing God. I just know I'm saved, sa <laughs> sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I want you all to pray for me that I hold true to the end. <laughs> Hallelujah. I testify like everybody else. Then I got smarter like you. Anyway, I found out I got sanctified when I got born again. Hallelujah. So I started testifying. I'm saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm going on. If anybody want to come, let's go. Hallelujah. You young whippersnappers. What will I got? We got to have some zeal for the young guys. They bring zeal, you know, and they'll, they'll stir up the old folks. Sometimes not good. I've been testifying this way for 45 years. I ain't changing today. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> but um, so I took that book and threw it up on my dresser and left it there. That was about September. About March or, or April of that year, I picked it up again. Eight months or so later, started looking at it. I'd always get to that price tag and, and freak out. But something kept drawing me back. God was using the inward witness. I didn't have a room of prophets prophesying, yea, thou art to go to Ramah and learn from the prophet of the nations, hallelujah. I didn't have any of that. <coughs> and let me say something. If you don't get it in your heart to begin with, when the tough times come, you won't stand. If you don't get it in your heart, you won't stand in the tough times. If you do it because somebody else told you to do it, you will quit. I guarantee it. I've seen it happen too many times. I've seen it happen in marriages. I've seen it happen in people trying to follow someone else's call on their life to the ministry, and they weren't called. Oh, me and my roommates used to get together and prophesy how we were called to be prophets and teachers to the nations. <laughs> At Ramah. At Ramah! We're sitting in there. We're, oh, we're prophets and teachers to the nations. Graduated. Got home, went to a church down in Greenville, North Carolina that had just started up while I was at Ramah, Faith and Victory Church, Pastor John Zabowski, and a wonderful pastor. I tell, I, I, to this day, I am ever grateful for the opportunity he gave me. He was young. He wasn't you know, as young as I was, but op the open door ministry and the opportunity to grow in the things of God and, and the leeway to grow in those things, he gave, he gave us, me and Janie, and, and uh, we're grateful to him for that. <clears throat> but um, I remember we, we were meeting in a little storefront and what was at, it used to be what they used to call the old Edwards Hardwell building on uh, 10th Street in Greenville. It was right next to Hollowell's Drugstore. Janie worked at Hollowell's Drugstore, and her boss would invite people to go to that little storefront church all the time. And he wouldn't go there because it was a storefront. You know, he went to the Methodist church. Now, later when we moved out and got a separate building, he came. But while we were in that little storefront, he, he just wouldn't come. But he would invite people. Well, you know, people come to the pharmacy, need the healing or whatever. And they were, he said, no, look, here, here, here. But I tell you what, you need to go over to that church right over there. He sent people over there all the time. <clears throat> but I remember we were sitting there. We had these old theater chairs from the old pit theater or whatever that they had given to the church that were just, I mean, your old wooden ones. I mean, rackety things. I mean, we had screwed them into the floor. We had painted concrete. I mean, it was just, it was a storefront. It was. And I'm on the front row one night. We hadn't, we hadn't been there. I mean, Janie and I, I come on, we got married. So about four or five months after I got out of Rama, and uh, we had left our PH church because <clears throat> now listen, I love our PH church, but at that time the conference superintendent sent out a letter to all the pastors saying, don't let people preach Hagen or preach Copeland in your churches. I just graduated from Rama. What am I going to do? <laughs> you know? I mean, I just graduated from the school that Brother Hagen runs. And uh, we, ha we had one of our pastors in the denomination, when he came back from Rama the year before me, they wouldn't give him a church. And so he had to go independent. So I, I left, not because of hard feelings, just you know, I got to go where I can do what God called me to do. You know? And, um, I'm sitting on the front row one night. Remember, I've been prophesying. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Thou art prophets and teachers to the nations. And something hit me in the top of my head, dropped down on the inside of me and said, I never called you to be a prophet or a teacher. I called you to be a pastor. Now, I didn't want to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> you got to understand, when I, that, during that era, pastor was a cuss word. 
because <clears throat> everybody wanted to travel and teach and have their ministry, you know, and sell their tapes and their books, you know, and, and fly all over the world and be the great man of faith and power and, and raise the dead and heal the sick and cast out devils. Go sit around with the same people all the time and preach to them? No way. You know? And, and of course, I understand where something that comes from because people can be mean. Yeah. They can be mean as dogs. I mean, junkyard dogs. They, they walk out of here and you know, pastor, we're behind you. And then when they get out of church, they say, that sorry rascal, I hate him. And he had one guy in the church one time. He went to a gas station, and this guy used to go to church. Came and said, I want to tell you one thing about that, Ed Taylor. Guy had been going to church. You know, and I tell you what the one thing was. The girl he was always trying to sleep with, I told her she needed to stop sleeping with him and serve the Lord. And if they were going to sleep with him, get married. And he didn't like that. Well, at Faith and Victory Church, you don't get your natural cake and, and topping, too. <laughs> you're going to get the cake and the ice, and you're going to get married. Just say it. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's how it works. Come on now. Yeah, he didn't like it because I told the girl to stop sleeping with him. Well, I need a mini choir at least. So they go, hallelujah, hallelujah. I need Gabriel. Preach, pastor. You see, I've got Gabriel Williams over here. And he said, preach, pastor. Didn't he, Janice? He had a deep, deep, yeah. resounding voice. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> and from that point forward, I knew God called me to pastor. Nobody prophesied it over me. We tried to prophesy ourselves out of it. Hello? Yeah. But the inner man, the inner witness, oh, thank God for the Holy Ghost on the inside. Yeah. Amen. We need to get still. Be still and know that I'm God. You're going to have to spend some time. Let's, oh, we, we, love the, we love the manifestation. I love the manifestation of the Spirit. But the Bible says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Some of the stuff that people are doing isn't profiting anybody. Yep. It's hurting them. It's pulling them back. It's keeping them out of the will of God. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you right now, you're watching me on, your, on, on, on the Internet. You don't listen to brother so-and-so. You don't listen to prophet so-and-so. You don't listen to the doctor of prophecy so-and-so. You listen down on the inside. You get down into the inner man and you hear what he's got to say. And follow that. And follow that guidance. And follow that voice. It'll keep you out of trouble and it'll keep, and it won't keep, it'll keep you from getting shipwrecked. Hallelujah. It's too dangerous. And I tell you, people, we need to be, you people, I know I'm talking to people on the internet. After, after something that happened earlier this year, man, I know God's using us on the internet. Man. Somebody walked into a, uh, somebody's room went and said, uh, listen, they were listening to me preach, and uh, they said, they listened to me preach, and they, they said, what's your teaching? I said, healing, and I was reading Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter and Matthew, and they were going, yeah, 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 he's talking about spiritual healing. And by the time he said that, I went, and some idiots out there think this is talking about spiritual healing. Right when he said that. I said, it's not. And then I took the scriptures to prove that it wasn't. <laughs> and, and I thought, people, God's using us on the internet. <laughs> I, I, got, I got to be realized our audience goes beyond here. It goes out there. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. We have to understand that the inward witness is the number one way. Not your roommate, not your buddy. Not your group of your, 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 your girl pals, your gal pals, your, your bros and all this. And, you know, your, your prophecy group, your cottage prayer meeting. Listen, it's nothing new. The stuff that people are doing today, they were doing when I first got saved uh, in 1979. Hello? And they had done it before that and other generations and so forth. Hallelujah. Actually, next week we're not going to get to part three. We're going to finish up part two. Because I'm, I'm, I'm over here and I'm going to stay here. I know I've told this story before, but I, it, it bears repeating in this particular um, line which we're ministering on. A number of years ago, we had, um, now y'all all know I came from Greenville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. 
That's my hometown. Uh, that's where I grew up, Aiden, outside of Greenville. But I was actually born in Greenville, spent the first three or four years, about the first eight years of my life in Greenville, and ended up moving to Aiden about the fifth grade. And then I finished out all my school in Aiden. So I, call, I claim that as my hometown, but I'm not native. I'm, I'm a native Pitt Countyan. So, you know, all right, so, you know, uh, I guess that kind of makes it all kosher, whatever. But, well, you know, we were, I, was, I was on staff in that church in Greenville, Faith and Victory Church of Greenville. They're now re-imaged church. Pastor John's still pastor, doing a great job. And um, but we, had a, we had East Carolina, obviously, was there. And so we had a, a lot of East Carolina students would show up. We'd, we'd go get people saved on the campus, and they'd come over. They came over to party, to the, the number one party school in the world, and got saved and ended up in church. Now, Green, now and the East Carolina folks, I, I think somebody finally said, what about them? They don't rank them anymore because they're experts. I mean... We, you know, for years, used to have the gas mask on the pumpkins because they had a riot downtown, like 1977 or 78. They had a riot downtown Greenville, and they wore gas masks. They, they gassed them because they were rioting and stuff downtown. Got carried away partying out the streets. And, um, but we get all these East Carolinas to say, get saved. We, had, we actually had someone that was from this area. It was going to school down there, get saved, get in church, get turned on to the Lord. And then when we came here to our pastor, when they were home and they had left East Carolina, they'd come visit us and stuff and so forth. And, but they had gone off down to one of these, these prophet schools. Now, that's not a New Testament thing. In the Old Testament, there was a school of the prophets. It's not, an, it's not a New Testament thing. You do not see school of the prophets in the New Testament. I believe in Bible training. I believe in Bible schools. I, believe, I, I think all those things are right. But, you know, somebody try, a lot of times people will go back and get stuff and try to use an Old Testament application in the New Testament, and it won't work that way. It just won't work that way. You know? And uh, so they, they got these, these schools of prophets. They're going to release thousands of prophets to the nations. How about just release thousands of ministers and let the Holy Ghost determine what they are? Hello? Do you, do you know what? The Bible says in Acts, the 13th chapter, look over there, put it up there, Acts 13, 1, 2, and 3, right through there. It says, now there was in the church in Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Y'all remember that? Um, as Barnabas and Simeon, they were called Niger and Lucius and Cyrene and Manon, and had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost says, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. You know, it never tells what work they were called to. It doesn't say. Go on, next verse there. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Verse 4. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Cilicia from the sentence of Cell Disciples. Now, Paul talks about later being a, an apostle and so forth. But here, when the Holy Ghost had the opportunity, yay, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, as the greatest apostles of all time. He didn't say anything. He just said, separate them for the work I've called them. Why? It's best to let things bear themselves out. It's best to let things prove themselves out. Amen? Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Amen? Let things prove... <clears throat> I know people that for years, I knew they were prophets. I knew they were a prophet. I knew their ministry. You saw it all over them. They'd never say it. You run into some folks, and they got prophet cards. I'm prophet so-and-so. Prophet so-and-so. Passing out prophet so-and-so cards. You know? Brother, I'll just be honest with you. Your, your gift to make room for itself. I said your gift to make room for itself. You don't, and some of these gifts, you don't, you don't, you don't need labels because you start getting prophet or apostle, those, those, those gifts, particularly those two seem to be the ones people get really messed up with. Uh -huh. Pastors, evangelists, and teachers, they don't get, but prophet and apostle, they'll get squirrely in a heartbeat with that title. I don't know what it is. I just don't know what it is about that, but you get people running around, 20, I'm 22 years old, I'm pro, got, got, a, got a card, I'm apostle so-and-so. You ain't live long enough to be an apostle. Amen? Yeah, that's right. You think about the time that Acts 13 was written, Paul had been, been in the ministry for a number of years. Mm -hmm. was already recognized as a, you know, from, the, from the account there as a prophet and a teacher and became an apostle later. But you've got to prove things out. Oh, yeah. Paul wrote, Timothy says, make full proof of thy ministry. You start walking in certain gifts or, or certain things, there needs to be some proof of the pudding. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
There needs to be some, some, some steadfastness in yourself. And you know, one of the things that, that the Word of God says not to do is lay hands on a novice. Why? You'll mess them up fast, as fast as they'll mess people up. Bring them in, train them, mentor them, grow them up, get them ready, and launch them out in due season so that they're a blessing and they, and they, they, they are prepared. I think you don't, you, you don't want to, you know, I, I know in my denomination growing up, they just wouldn't put people out there just because they had a zeal. I love zeal. You know, they, well, the Bible says that they have a zeal but not according to knowledge. Zeal for God but not according to knowledge. You don't want to be zealous. You want to have zeal according to knowledge. Yeah. And there's you want it profitable. Amen? So, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're do, doing the right things. But being led by the Spirit's a part of this. Not led by other people. Not led by other people. My God, people will mess you up in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I listen to some of the prophets that were given over me, I don't know where I'd be. I, I, I might be in... I don't know where I'd be. Well, anyway, let's backtrack a little bit. I kind of got off on that. You know, I'll tell you what. One of, the favorite thing, one of the favorite prophecies people like to give people is who you're going to marry or who not to marry. Well, let the people who look at each other make that decision. Pastor Hagen used to preach in, in marriage class, and uh, he'd say, Man was going to go into the pastor. He's going to be a pastor. And he needs a woman that, you know, needs a wife that could play the piano and lead worship. So he'd marry him some woman uh, from the Bible school that could lead worship and play the piano. And so about two weeks after the honeymoon, he's sitting at the morning breakfast table with his newspa- newspaper open up and dropped that newspaper down, looked across the table and said, Sing, woman, sing. <laughs> some of y'all get that on the way home. If you married her, he realized she wanted nothing to look at. Want nothing to be a trap. It was sing and remind me why I married you. Yeah. Hello? Well, see, when you start doing things like marrying people because somebody prophesied, you better go get your prophecy, prophesy again, prophesy again, prophesy again. You remind me why I married that woman. I can't stand her. Hallelujah. See, you just can't be, I'll tell you, it can't be that way. All right? So, we want, to, we want to be led by the Spirit of God from the inner witness. His primary way is to lead us by the inner witness. He doesn't lead us by fleas. It's not going to classical Pentecostal. And let me, let me say something, because, you, you know, I, I, I grew up classical Pentecostal, came over among the word of faith, charismatic. Um, I love my Pentecostal heritage. I'm going to be honest with you. I love my Pentecostal heritage, because there are things I got there that, people in the, that I went into the word of faith and the charismatic circles didn't have. There were some things about the Holy Ghost and the flow of the Spirit and the yieldedness to the Holy Ghost that those other groups didn't know about. I mean, just, they just didn't know about it. And I'm glad I got to bring it over. Amen. And, I, and you know, I, just, I remember, I go to the altar, and you'd have people praying over you that, that, that they were children in the beginning of Pentecost. And they were in the altars getting prayed over. And now they're passing that on to another generation. I said, I, I thank God for that heritage. And I've been able to mix it with this. But one of the things we used to do, we talk about all the time. Well, I put a fleece before the Lord. And we didn't have, I don't, I didn't ever hear a pastor get up and really tell me, you can't do that. You know, because you, you met, I'll tell you, in denominational churches, you mess with people's pet doctrine, they'll throw you out. They'll get, pastor don't believe in fleeces, he's getting voted out next time. Yeah. Because they're on a four-year rotating cycle, they'll vote you in and out. I've seen good pastors get voted out just because one person had some money, didn't like them, and got enough people in the church to vote against them. You know? Called to be there. Anointed to be there. But brother wants to run out and run the whole wide world because he's got some deep pockets. Doesn't want him there because he said something he didn't like. Well, turn around, cat. You don't like getting your fur rubbed the wrong way? Turn around and get it stroked the right way. Now, All right, enough said there. But fleeces, we used to, you know, we, come on, because Gideon put out a fleece. How many of Gideon put out a fleece? You know, and he, he told the Lord, you know, I'm going to put it out here, and if it's, if it's, if it's dry on, on the ground and wet on the fleece, uh, I know you spoke to me. And then that wasn't good enough. He had to do it twice. Had to reverse it the next day. And God honored it. Why? Because under the Old Testament, only the prophet, priest, and king had the anointing, and he had to be led by, he had to be led by outward things. 
and not inward things. He was led by an outward manifestation under the new covenant. You'd be led by the inner man. God says, that was the, and, and, and so we started using that term. We picked up that term. It was a fleece. It was a, it was a piece of wool, goat, uh, um, lamb skin with the fleece on it. And that was what it was a fleece. When most people put out fleeces now, they say, I'm putting out a fleece. And what they're really doing now is they're putting out a challenge to the Lord to prove that he's really speaking to them. Jesus said, my sheep, in John 10, my sheep know my voice. He did not say, I will fleece them. <laughs> did he? He said, my sheep know my voice. But we, we picked that up, and so people started doing it. And things become tradition sometimes, and not in a, not in a bad way, not people trying, not trying to be mischievous or evil or wrong. It's just they pick up something and begin to use it, and it becomes part of our culture. It does. And so, um, you know, even the charismatic got their, got their culture. Oh, we're spiritual. We don't have animals in our church. Yes, you do. There they are. They're called wall hymnals. Yeah, they're wall hymnals. Oh, we're spiritual because we don't have hymnals. Yeah, you do. They even put the little CCLI license number up there and who wrote it and all that. It's a wall hymnal. Um, yeah, okay, thank you for our, our wall hymnal. You know, who wrote it? You know, I mean, all that kind of stuff. Thank you. We get, so we picked up that tradition of fleecing. Particularly in Pentecostal churches, they did that. Because they were, you know, they, they, we believed in manifestations. We believed in God speaking to us. There's a lot of things that we believed that a lot of the other denominations kind of frowned upon. But the Pentecostal churches, and I'm talking, we have, we have about four or five major Pentecostal denominations. Um, uh, contrary to popular belief, the white ones weren't the first ones. The Church of God in Christ was the first Pentecostal denominations. Assemblies of God came out. They would go to the meetings, and they had to sit in the back and not at the front. And they went to the leaders and said, we need to start our own for our people. And they started the AG Church. And, that's, those are the, and then, and then the, the Four Square came out in the early 1900s. The Pentecostal Holiness came out in the early 1900s. And you had some other Pentecostal groups that came out. But the Pentecostals believed that God spoke to us, that God manifested himself, that God did supernatural things consistently and regularly in the life of the believer and so but one of the things we made a tradition was fleecing now really what it was was i want to i want a natural confirmation that you are really speaking to me with your spirit that's not new testament they that are led by the spirit are the sons it is not a new testament thing to fleece what's wrong with it it's natural it's not being led by the Spirit. It's being led by an outward manifestation. Now, Lord, here's the deal. If I get five phone calls in the next week booking me up for two months preaching, I'll go preach. Now, here's the problem with that. <clears throat> what if you're not called to go preach and the devil accommodates you and gets five bozos to call you? It's like that farmer one day, he's out, out in his yard, and uh, he's, 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 he's uh, praying, and about, you know, the Lord, did you call me to the ministry or not? Looked up in the sky, and there was a GP in the sky. He dropped everything, went out, fell flat on his face, came back and started praying, Lord, Lord, I don't understand. You know, you gave me such a wonderful, marvelous, powerful sign to go preach. And the uh, Lord said, what are you talking about? He said, well, there was a GP in the sky. I said, go preach. He said, no, that meant go plow. Hallelujah. If you, if you depend on a natural sign, you can get things mixed up. And that's what we're talking about. You've got to learn to be led by the inward witness and the knowing on the inside so that you're not susceptible. Lord, if the next person walks up to me and tells me, you know, that my hair looks good ruby red, I'm going to go preach. And you just have a coincidence that somebody liked your hair that color. Even if it was blonde. I mean, y'all, you cannot let natural things govern your life. All right? Now, that is why God 
has given pastors. Amen. That's why the spirit of wisdom and counsel is on ministers to help guide you through these things when you're when you're you're younger and you're beginning to learn and you're trying to you're trying to navigate these waters. The, the, now my job is not to be your Holy Ghost. Amen. My job is to point you in the right direction. <laughs> I'm just messing. How can you tell? <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> no, I'm just, there were two glasses under here. <laughs> I went to that church, the pastor, happy God, filled his glass up with water. No, somebody else filled it up before church started. I believe, now that I, believe, I believe in miracles. I believe in the supernatural. But God wants you to learn to be led by his spirit and listen to the inward witness and not get messed up. And not let somebody else mess you up. Some people want to be your Holy Ghost because it makes them feel important. I'm going to tell you, as your pastor, I love you. I don't need to be your Holy Ghost. I don't want the responsibility of telling you when you come home. I don't want the responsibility of what to do when your marriage falls apart because I prophesied you're supposed to get married. I don't want that responsibility. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, God said in Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart I'll give you, a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll take out the stony heart. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And we're going to stop there. Um, let me just kind of follow up there. Remember in the Old Testament, only the prophet, priest, and king had the spirit. Thus men had to be led by outward signs and wonders. This is not true in the New Testament, as we just read from Ezekiel 36, 26 through um, 27. Yeah, 26 and 27. Thus the need for outward signs or fleeces are negated. If one is persistent to fleece today, he might get fleeced by the devil or even just by happen chance. Just certain, certain, you know, certain things happen and the people, I tell you, you can't take things as a sign. You know, I remember um, years ago when we first got saved, we, we, we would meet um, Janie and I and then uh, another guy and his girlfriend. And there was several of us that would all meet and, and kind of get together and pray. We were excited about the Lord. So this is the thing. We, we don't know how to take the excitement of, of young, zealous people who are turned on to the Lord and channel that so that it's a blessing. So they always run off and get their own little prayer groups, their coffee houses, they do their thing, and it gets out of hand. So we're praying one night, and the candle burned down one side. And when I went, oh, that's a sign from God. I still don't remember what he said the sign was, but I couldn't remember if he ever said there was a sign, you know, what the sign meant, but that was a sign from God. No, it was sitting under the vent. And the air was blowing. And you know, if air blows on a candle, it'll blow the, the heat off to one side. It won't burn evenly. It burned down one side because the, the, the draft was blowing it the wrong, uh, another way. Lord, have mercy. We are, this is some kind of spiritual sign. And you know, everybody, ooh. Actually, one of the girlfriends went and told the pastor at the church that we were all meeting and having homosexual seances. Because she didn't want her boyfriend going. I got caught on the carpet. I mean, look, I mean, I'm stud jock. I mean, I beat my head in brick walls, lift weights. I'm, I'm, I'm benching 360, squatting 400, deadlifting 400. I, I love Janie. And I just don't look, I don't look at guys and go, ooh, I didn't know. I just want me. Didn't, didn't, did not, did not phase me that way. You know what I'm saying? So the pastor called me and said, I'm not going to have that. I said, pastor, I said, look, now I know he said it. I think he just got excited, but you know, and all this, all this other stuff, that ain't going, that ain't happening. Yeah. You know, the, devil, see, the devil getting stuff, start messing stuff up. You just got, 
You can't make something out of something that's not there. So why would you say that? Listen, I've been married for 32 years this year. <laughs> July be 32 years. Uh, dated Jenny for four years, so we've been, we've been dating and married 36 years. Um, and uh, I'm all man about her. All right? She's still the love of my life. Amen? Never, but, you know, that girl didn't want a boyfriend there. And so she told that thing, you know, all because one person got out of hand with the candle burning down one thing and tried to make something out of it that it wasn't. Now, I know that, but see, you could, somebody could have gone and thought, oh, God is there. They're being led by the Spirit. Look at that spiritual manifestation. And they let that manifestation lead them. You can't be led by manifestations. And you can't be led because somebody told you something that was accurate in your life. Because there is such thing as familiar spirits out there, and they will operate in people's lives. I remember they used to have some guy down on one the television show. <laughs> had a three named guy there. <laughs> you know, talking about Brother Bill. <laughs> I'm not gonna call his name. And I don't even know if he's in the ministry anymore or even alive. I don't know. But he would he would still start telling people everything about their personal life. Let me say something here. I know I'm trying to get off of this. I'm trying to let you go. We'll receive the offering and let you go here in just a minute. You watch out for people who start giving you information about you that has no purpose behind it. Hello? You live at such and such, such and such, and you do it in this. Now, I know Jesus when, when um, Philip came to him and said, before you were here, I saw you under the tree. You know, I understand that. There, there, there are things that God does do. But I tell you, you watch, when, when you start like, we don't have Jesus doing that to all 12 disciples or any of the other 70. Just that one guy. This guy get on there every night and just pull, everybody, if they pull it out of the audience, they start telling them something about themselves. Now, wait a second. Jesus is my example. And if I don't see Jesus doing it to every single one of his disciples, how is he, somebody going to get up and do it to everybody in the audience? And you live here, and you, you drive this kind of car, and, you know, uh, just last night you told your wife this, and, and all that kind of stuff. And you know what happens? The, the, the wallets, wham, there goes the money. I actually did find out he was living in homosexuality later. So what was the end of all? Raising money. And people built their lives on things they would say to them because they got them with the hook well you you drive a white Cadillac with green interior that's right well to what end is these things does it does it give glory to God or does it give glory to the man is the man enhanced or is Jesus enhanced he said I will draw all men unto me if I be lifted up from the earth I will draw all men unto me. Is it drawing people to Jesus or is it drawing them to the man? Amen. And on that wonderful note, we'll pick up next week with the inward voice. Mm -hmm.